Elizabeth Callahan. I'm the manager of adult programs, um, and this is vice director of education and program development, Rodia Harper. And we would like to welcome you to the Brooklyn Museum. Every Thursday night, we have programming from music to films to tours of the collection. Um, and once a month, we have this program in conversation, where cutting edge cultural thinkers um, come together to discuss timely topics. Tonight, we're really pleased to introduce to you uh, a conversation um, entitled Acts of Resistance and Inclusion in African American Art. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I think we're all here. I know, but you know, I want to warm up the audience a little bit so that we can be awake when the conversation is going. My name is Radia Harper, as you heard from Elizabeth, and I just wanted to also welcome you here and just bring you up to speed that while we're having this conversation about African American art and artists, this is not a new topic for us at the Brooklyn Museum. We have a history of doing a relevant contemporary program uh, for a very long time, and just recently in the past couple of months, we've had programs that have included Fred Wilson and Michaeline Thomas and Carrie Mae Weems. And at each of these programs, the topic of conversation uh, related to now dig this has circled back into the conversation at each of these programs. And I don't know how long ago it's been now, a month maybe, that Danny got in touch with me and put um, me in touch with Will. And he suggested this program topic, and of course it was extremely timely, and we thought, let's do this. This is an important conversation, and we wanted to be a part of it. So I'm very pleased that you're here, and I'm very pleased that we were, we were able to put this panel together. And I just want to say something about Danny, who wants to really put another uh, context to this program, that most of you know Danny as a prolific writer and painter. Okay. And I think of you as an empresario, a person who puts art and audience together, and one of the best ones at it in Brooklyn and in New York City. And Danny is also um, a member of the a board committee at the Brooklyn Museum, the Education Committee, and we're really excited that he's a part of our family and important to us here at the Brooklyn Museum. So please welcome him, and thank you all for coming. This conversation has been going on for a long time um, about inclusion, who gets in, who doesn't get in, who gets on walls, who doesn't get on walls. But it's come back around, it comes back around every so often when something happens that challenges uh, people's belief about what should have been said. Now, I think this was um, reviewed by Ken Johnson and my good buddy and uh, Lou Villalongo. Uh, looked at the review and said, this isn't right. And started, and I picked it up, and it was a Facebook conversation that turned into a movement. Uh, and it brought to mind how often over the years um, people have challenged the status quo about getting the work of African Americans on walls. And now it's come to the point that we, if you make it through the walls, then who looks at that work, and who validates that work, and who says whether it's good or whether it's bad? and what criteria do they use to do that. And so the conversation continues on, and we put together a panel of people to look at that and see where, where, where it lies. 17 years ago, because of the same issues, inclusion, I started Rush Arts Gallery and Corridor Gallery to make sure that the work of African Americans were on walls. Um, for many people, they don't see that this is an ongoing problem. They come into this, and a lot of these people are young, they come into this with this. Can they while they're over here on the wall, and Micheline Thomas just had her show, and everybody's at all these great galleries in Chelsea. But there's been a long history of struggle to get there. And we want to put some context on where that, what that struggle is, and where we're at in that struggle, because many of us believe that that struggle is ongoing, and that because we're on the walls of the Brooklyn Museum, and because we're in the walls, of galleries in Chelsea, that, that is not as far out of the inclusion as it is because, you know, what type of art is going on there? And there's a myriad of questions that are going to be asked by this, by this um, panel. But largely it's about who validates that, who's the gatekeepers? That's where it came in for me. Who are the gatekeepers of who sees what and who doesn't see what? So I'm going to turn this over to our moderator. I'm going to just introduce all the artists and they'll speak in the 
Chinese order, guys, you should think about that. Um, the first person is William Villalago. Um, is an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn. Um, Villalago is a recipient of the prestigious Louis Comfort Tiffany Award and the John Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptures Grant. His work is included in several notable collections, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and Princeton University's Art Museum. His work has been reviewed in Art in America, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. Bill Longo is currently represented by a Susan England Gallery here in New York City. Next up is Mary Shore, directly to my left, who is a New York-based artist and writer noted for her advocacy of painting in a post-medium visual culture and for her contributions to feminist art history. Shore's work balances political and theoretical concerns with formalist and material passions. Her areas of interest include the gendered production of our history, the analysis and practice of painting in postmodern culture, and the relationship between political and conceptual concerns with materiality and expression. She is the author of the book, A Decade of Negative Thinking, with a lot um, essays on art, politics, and daily life, and the blog, um, A Year of Positive Thinking. Um, next up is Kamara Holloway. Kamara is an assistant professor of art history at the University of Delaware. Um, her work research centers on modernism and photography within the circumatlantic world, paying special attention to the impact of race on art and aesthetics. Holloway is a co-founder of the Association of Critical Race Art History, an organization dedicated to promoting the study of race within art history. Our last, final, but not least, speaker is Adamola Olukbafola. Um, Adamola is a renowned contemporary artist whose work has set standards of innovative excellence. Um, Olukbafola is um, one of the founders of the Wisu Artists, co-founder of the New York chapter of Nika, co-founder of Dwyer Cultural Center in Harlem. I didn't know that. Um, published uh, and has been published in literally hundreds of. Please welcome our wonderful panelists. <laughs> William, if I can start with you, what I would like is, you know, thinking about Morrison's ex um, kind of um, expression of how race functions and orders our social order. Talk to me about how you received and assimilated the Ken Johnson Review and a bit about the petition. Okay. Um, I, I think the, the, the point that I picked saying is that the kind of this idea that um, uh, sort of neurosis, you know, or the, 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 this kind of phenomenon. Um, and that's what I picked up on in Ken Johnson's article, and particularly um, the <coughs> point uh, that he makes that the, the, the show would be uh, divide the audience. Yeah. And that and that he asserts that with a kind of uh, a, a kind of a authority and assurance that 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 he understands this audience somehow, and so the question becomes like, who is this who is this sort of mythical audience who he's talking to? Because in the art community that I exist in, I, you know, which is extremely diverse, that you know, there, you know, I don't get a sense that people feel that they have to choose a camp when they sort of go into that show or choose a side or, or, or feel somehow um, that the work is leaving them out or including them. Or functioning on any other level, but but as you know, art objects um, and, and ways to think about uh, visuality. Um, so it, you know that you know what Dan was saying earlier is that there was this build up of conversation in terms of in terms of why we wrote the petition, which is that you had um, uh, you know a lively conversation, including Ken Johnson on Facebook, you know, our community kind of saying, like, you know, we want to talk about this, we want to talk about this, and the New York Times saying, you can't, you can't talk about it, you can't, we're not going to have this discussion, basically, by denying letters, um, you know, we, it's a letter writing campaign that was denied, so um, myself and Colin Asper, who's, who's also here tonight, um, Anupa Faruqi, Steve, Stephen Locke and um, Dushko Petrovich uh, came together and said, well, what can, what can we do so that people can have a discussion in the face of 
being completely denied by this sort of authority. So, so we went to the oldest thing in the book, which is like start a petition. You know, like you know, get a pothole fixed. You know, start a petition for that, and then, then surely we can kind of allow people to express themselves. And over 1,600 people did uh, express themselves. And curators, artists, real art. curators, uh, uh, art historians, artists um, uh, of all you know shapes, colors, and um, and backgrounds, um, and saying, influence, saying, and influence, saying saying that. There is something fundamentally wrong about the the positionality of this of this um, this review, um, and uh, you know I, you know it's, it's, you're not supposed to do that. And I think that was the thing. You're not supposed to. We kind of rocked the boat. You're not you're not supposed to. You're you know you're supposed to just be quiet and let you know that get said in the article, and and, and you, you can't you can't talk to the New York Art. New York Times about the review as a policy uh, of theirs, and so you know, I guess you know, we decided to say, okay, well, we're, we're, we we know we're not supposed to do that, but we're going to do it anyway. So you're not supposed to resist, is that right? You're not supposed to resist the status quo, the kind of high yeah. end art world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Mary, you have a long history writing about um, the gender dynamics of um, art historians. What's your take, both on the kind of identitarian concerns of now like this, but also his piece on the female gaze, but the kind of the, the, the work that women naturally seem to produce. <laughs> you know, in a way, I, I actually didn't even notice that. I, I don't take, I hate to say this, but I don't take Ken Johnson very seriously. <laughs> so, um, I mean, if any of you read the New York, the, 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 if any of you read the New York Times know who the critics are and what their points of view are and what their strengths are and those who have strengths and don't have strengths. So I, I didn't even notice that particular, the, the, uh, the thing about the, the show in Philadelphia about women. I did talk to him. I happened to be on a panel with him the night before the review of Now Dig This came out. But I thought, I, which I can talk about a little bit, I listened to a tape of the conversation because it, it was kind of a preview of this entire debate um, and some of the issues. Um, so I have notes and I can refer to them. But um, I think the first thing that I maybe would just introduce myself as is, is um, my, my introduction to being an artist was um, through feminism, or actually that wasn't even the introduction, but certainly the awareness early on that if you were constituted as other by a mainstream, and that applies not just to uh, black artists, but to women artists, to gay artists, queer artists. Um, and you, you, you had to constitute your own discourse. You had to create your own curatorial practices, your own editorial practices, your own teaching practices. Um, you, you know, you had to write. You had to do everything to create a discourse. And certainly, the 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 the, the artists involved in movement that is inscribed in the show Now Dig This had an incredible web of, of galleries and um, publications, really impressive, fascinating material. So the problem really is not that. Um, the problem is then how does that get into the next step, you know, of being somehow entered into a canon, and this is, gets to what you were talking about, about the gatekeepers. So my own experience has been to a lot of my writing has been taking on some of the major gatekeepers of the art world, which is why I don't think Ken Johnson in, as an individual is that important. I mean, a lot of my writing has taken on the editors and writers of October Magazine, who maybe now people don't read October as they did 20 years ago, but they have a lot of influence on um, institutions in New York, museum institutions, the, the show, the abstraction show currently at MoMA, behind the scenes, the ideology of October and their canon that they have formed of modernism, the history of modernism is in effect. So, um, so in doing that, I, I, I began to realize that there's something operative that I began to call the white list in opposition to the black list of the McCarthy period. The McCarthy period, there actually was 
a list. I mean, people were on a paper, you know, written down on paper, don't hire so and so, they are communists. But the white list is something much more subtle because it's not visible. It's just that you get ignored. First, you're told that probably what you're doing is wrong. You're doing it wrong. There's some, something wrong with your methodology. But the next thing is that you, you, you don't get quoted. You don't, you, you don't get referenced. Whatever the critique is that you're putting out, it just vanishes. And um, so, it, it, so in some way, the canon remains impermeable. Although I think ultimately the canon gets overturned because movement goes forward and um, you know people just forget about what that canon was. You know, at some point. So there, there's both movement and um, and non-movement. One other thing I'll say just as an introduction is I think one of the problems with the people that I've been kind of attacking, and I think this might be true in the art world, is the people in the art world often tend to think of themselves as being resistant or that they are in a position of marginality, even when they have a lot of power. So then they can't see that somebody who's also who feels even more marginalized by them is speaking to them because they're so involved with maintaining their own, um, what they think of as their own ego position. They're, so they're not actually admitting to whatever power they have. And that influences the writing that they do also. Thank you. Um, and well, Ken Johnson's kind of capacities aside for a second. <laughs> Kamara, I was thinking about um, when the Ken Johnson thing happened and folks started writing the petition. But here we go again. You know, we, this kind of historical fault line in um, American aesthetics and in, in American, to at least contemporary history. Talk to me about your response to the whole kerfuffle, if we call it that. Um, I'm an art historian, which means I spent many, many years working to get my PhD, and now I'm spending many more years working to get tenure. But my focus is on research and a longer view of art history. And um, I am very committed to art history, but art history in and of itself is not a perfect discipline. There are always uh, questions about um, our values, our ideals, our taste, our politics, um, all of these elements are attached to the objects that we call art. And so when we speak about them, um, we should be cognizant of what those things are. They do affect how we um, understand these objects and respond to them. So for me, that was ultimately um, the flaw of this particular piece. Um, I didn't um, initially want to weigh in in any fashion, um, but I did covertly ask a uh, friend of mine who is a person who studied the history of African Americans in the museums, a art historian named Bridget Cooks, who is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, to um, write a piece. I knew she had some opinions. And um, her, the title of her, of her op-ed piece, which um, she could not get published in the Times, was in fact, uh, Here We Go Again. Um, the Times officially stated that they do not accept op-eds on reviews. So they were not going to further the discussion <laughs> in any shape or form. The sort of uh, energy around this response to Johnson is sort of characteristic of the entire history of art and the debate over cultural values that we have um, and that we tend to think don't occur in relationship to art because art is pure and universal but in fact are very much always uh, in play um, when we talk about these things. So um, Johnson's perspective is a, a rather old-fashioned mid-century perspective that can be considered to be a formalist, what we call a formalist position, um, which says that the um, art objects should be completely divorced from the social. That's a very um, particular 
point of view that is usually now disregarded by most art historians who are interested in social and cultural histories of art. So um, most of us do happen to take into account uh, the world and the cultures that we live in and how they affect art. Um, for my own particular uh, investments, uh, which are often what is ignored when one assumes a position like his from the center, is the idea to be able to step away from such concerns. And I think that in particular is what Toni Morrison was speaking about. Um, however, we all know that race has always been uh, central to how this particular country works and that uh, the construct of race in this country has been um, one of the most successful global exports that we've ever produced. So it really does shape uh, a global culture uh, at this time. Um, I have always been committed to African and African American art, art and the study of it, which is still very difficult to do. Um, the documentation and knowledge about um, works by African American artists is still very hard to come by, and the full story of who has made um, work, uh, who are people of African descent who have lived um, in this country or in this hemisphere, there's still a lot of work to be done. But uh, also um, what had emerged uh, in my consciousness and that of um, people of my, uh, now I can say, generation of art historians who um, came to age in the sort of, in the 90s, uh, is that the um, impact of the rise of theory and its integration into uh, the academy and, and its uh, impact on art history in particular meant that um, we noticed, because we were working on artists of color, that issues of race applied to African American artists, but also in other contexts, were not being addressed by the discipline. But the discipline itself was very much shaped by notions of race. Race shapes who can make art to begin with, um, whether that art gets seen, and then how we respond to it. So on the level of production, exhibition, and reception, uh, fundamentally, race determines uh, those issues. Similar to the way that Linda Nocklin articulated in her famous uh, 1971 essay, Why Are There No Great Women Artists? She laid out the institutional uh, and systematic um, way in which women were excluded from the art world historically. And that is true for queer artists and is true for artists of color. So we have taken it upon ourselves to foreground um, race as a structuring mechanism in how we understand art, and that's part of really what our project is. And so uh, when I asked Bridget to write, she wrote it for a blog that I have that promotes those ideas. So. There's so much to talk about, um, but before we get into the, the thick of it, um, Adam, although you've been around for a little while, you were at a time where um, there's a thing called the Black Arts Movement. A lot of the joking I've been hearing lately is about Will's petition is a return to the Black Arts Movement, you know, when folks felt that they could say stuff, they could respond, they could resist. How did you receive and assimilate um, this contemporary slap in the face? First place, we understand that the critics are a peculiar lot. Yes, they are. <laughs> they are paid. They make their living supposedly criticizing. Supposedly an informed criticism. Ken Johnson's analysis of comments are very uninformed. If he really understood the context of the work that was there, he would understand that the production from artists of African descent is wide and varied. So to uh, summarize that exhibition as a pillar of what black art is and how you go about commenting on black art is way off base in the first place. Because if you look at what is quote unquote, quote unquote, the black arts movement, it is wide and varied. Uh, you have artists like Jack Whitten, 
William T. Williams, Joe Overstreet, who work in the, and Norman Lewis is a perfect example, who was in and among many of the abstract expressionists, but was never recognized. The artists that I mentioned, such as William T. Williams, Jack Whitney, and others, also work in the abstract genre. How do you classify them? They are, they are African Americans, but they're working in a medium that some would regard as European. The same way that this Ken Johnson went about uh, claiming that assemblage is something that is uniquely European. And if you look back in African culture, the whole idea of putting stuff together and creating an artistic piece would go right back to many of the altars that come out of many of the thousands of years. Thousands of years. Right. So uh, again, the important thing I need to emphasize here is that if we're told, if we're speaking about the black arts movement, you're not just speaking about the visual arts number one. There was a unique and, and really phenomenal cooperation and interaction that was going on between theater, dance, literature. I for one illustrated several books by Barocco, Larry Neal, and others. I worked very closely with dancers who were trying to recreate the whole genre of dance that spoke to the liberation and freedom of people of color. So the context upon which many of these critics approach African American artists of color is all centered because they are not looking at the reason for why the art is created. And just to close, the works that if Ken Johnson did not know that these were people of color, he just went into that exhibition and just looked at the work. The assemblage is no different from, say, Picasso and any of the of modern masters. Who were themselves inspired by African art. Exactly. So, well, that's yeah. a whole other issue. But the point is, if you just looked at the art without being intellectual rubis, then he would, he would have possibly a whole different perspective here. The fact that it is labeled as a show of African-American artists infected his opinion. I mean, he actually says in the review, um, but it makes a difference, but it makes a difference to know that Mr. Edwards is African-American. And this is interesting to me. I want to think about um, what etymologists suggested about the kind of wide and varied quality of the work that African Americans produce. Troubles the question, I mean, long questions from Italy Lott, Chet Langs and Hughes, the Negro Artists and Racial Mountain, about this tension, this, which is a kind of American tension, about are you an artist or you're a black artist? And for many contemporary artists, um, that label black is anathema, and somehow is a death knell for the gatekeeper. Is the development, the sustainability, the viability of a black ascetic tradition something that's desirable? Is it futile? Can we see the outlines of it? And I'm asking this question not about black celebrity artists. I'm asking the question about formally, conceptually. Can we identify anything at all that we can call a black ascetic tradition? And we'll go in the same order where we can jump in if you'd like, but I think for, we can jump in anywhere. Kamara? I would say that um most people would find it hard to um, think about their art specifically in that way. I mean, some, usually the thinkers, uh, the Larry Neals, the Alan Locks, etc., have articulated such positions. The artists themselves have probably been less deliberate in their decisions. They want to make hostile to that label. They want to make art and they want to get it out there and they want to get it shown and they'd like to have it uh, examined and experienced very thoughtfully. So the um, notions about uh, a black radical tradition. A black aesthetic tradition. A black aesthetic It can be radical. A radical. A black aesthetic tradition has um, only been a 20th century question to a certain extent. Okay. Um, artist 
prior to um, the early 20th century um, never um, explicitly made those kinds of articulations. Um, it's only when African Americans really become a co uh, cohesive modern and national uh, co like cohort in, in the 1920s after World War I that the black leadership begins to push a uh, civil rights political agenda and the idea that the arts must participate in that um, ha becomes the question and whether or not there is something inherently black to some um, something produced by a black person uh, becomes uh, a matter of debate. Let me ask you a question, Jamar, and this is for everyone, just to follow up on that and for the interest, or in the interest of clarity. What I'm not, what I'm not asking is, you know, I'm a black artist, like, pounding your chest. I'm asking something yeah. a little more subtle. What, I just want to repeat the question or clarify the question just a bit. It's all open-ended. Tradition is desirable or not. I'm asking if it's desirable or not. But what you said initially about the fact that you know we live in a society that's always already raced. Yes. That's how arts get produced, disseminated, how it circulates, and how it's received and read, right? And so for what whatever our self-identifications or pronouncements about what we do in the studio, it's marked as a you know, piece of work with Mary just said, right? And so negotiating that terrain is really complicated. So I guess what I'm suggesting, and again, I'll ask the question again, is just, is it desirable? Is it futile? Does it make any sense that we cohere around this mantle called black aesthetic tradition? But did, I'm, I'm curious. I think that's a flaw. I mean, I'm saying it's a, it's a flawed. I'm saying the artists themselves are probably not focusing on that issue, and it's others who are focusing on that issue. They get caught up in the expectation of whether or not their art meets a definition of blackness or um, as my colleague Jacqueline Francis talks about in the 1920s, Negro art. They themselves are, are like all other artists making art. We think about uh, the... It's interesting that when you say art is now Derased or something. But I'm not saying artists derased, but I'm saying artists are not artists themselves. From what I can understand, are not thinking um, until they are required externally to say whether my art fits within a black aesthetic tradition or not. Their work speaks to their own experiences, which are inherently racialized, and their work may comment on race issues. But the idea of whether it has to comply with the notion of a black aesthetic is determined beyond Can I, I just say something? Is I think it, you know, even to, to her point, I think it, it may be desirable, um, but I don't know if it's desirable to artists necessarily. Um, it's so, so, yeah. you know, it's politically so, in, so, in, so, in other, so, in other words, it's like, uh, the, the desire is is to have something canonical. To, the desire is to have something um, uh, of connoisseurship in, in, in the market. I don't think that, but I think I think that artists, you know, probably move. You know, I do. But I move through um, my work, not uh, sitting there uh, making sure that it's either crossed eyes or dotted. Was them. suggesting not to cut the words, well, but what Marshall was suggesting was wasn't about complying. Or conform or anything like that. He was proposing that there's some utility, some serviceability to um, his body work, for instance, he was suggesting. <laughs> um, but other people of his ilk and his stature, that for him constitutes something that might look like how for all his flaws, a tradition. That's not something that you inherit and you just assimilate, but that's something that you can reference, you can yeah. point to. And so like the idea that somehow artists are just artists and they're not at all concerned with race. I get that, but it's, a, it's a, another question he's asking about the utility of something that coheres around this I, thing called blackness that I, might be useful to the generation to come after. Not, I, I can't believe anybody would not agree to that. I think the problem for me in, in your formulation is the word, or his formulation, is the idea of aesthetic because that relates in some way to the idea of the style. Um, and and the, the conflict that I see 
as, as a teacher and looking at, at work done by black artists, and it's interesting he broke but, uh, um, Jack Whitten's work up as an example, is that um, there's a, there's a, there are two separate things. One is, do you represent? In other words, in your work, do you represent something that somebody else, whether they know you or not, is going to say this is by a black artist? So there are certain signs and tropes that, that might indicate that. And the other are, are, are artistic styles that, um, and sometimes the two come together for an artist who will engage with that, but there are artists who don't necessarily want to, and they do maybe have, there are things that have led in their lives that are racialized, that are part of their background, that may lead them to do this or that, yeah. although they're similar to what also might lead somebody else to do this or that, but they may not want to represent, and I think those artists um, then have to deal with both black and white culture, or white and black culture, looking at them and saying, you, you, we want you to represent. You know, why aren't you representing? Yeah, and then you're left give you two historical incidents that support this idea. In the 1920s, when there was a critical mass of African American visual artists who were seeking exhibition opportunities, and the Harmon Foundation created art, uh, art awards and then art exhibitions. They framed the exhibitions and the work as Negro art, as racial art. And Alan Locke came in and said that work by African Americans should display some kind of racial essence. That put certain pressures on artists to respond to that mandate, and some produced work that might be called, quote unquote, representative of a black aesthetic, let's say Aaron Douglas. But his work prior to that moment of this sort of insistence was traditionally academic. The discourse around the work put pressure on the artist to deal with the concept of a black aesthetic, and that's where the Negro artist and the racial mountain comes out of by Langston Hughes and the response by George Schuyler and the other writings from that period. But Locke is an, is a, is an aesthetic philosopher, and he's making certain determinations, saying that a racial art would allow for certain social political things to occur. After, in the, and more recently, 1963, you know, A. Philip Randolph goes to Romare Bearden and says, we should have some, you, some of you guys doing work to support the March on Washington. And the group of African American artists known as Spiral is created. Again, a mandate of creating art that articulated blackness for the group, um, for social reasons, is being put out there. Now, if you take that aside, the work may or may not reflect black qualities, and there may be something inherently black about the work produced by black artists, but when they're putting their work out there, it's before that moment, and they, I think they find themselves having to respond to a mandate. No, I get it, because they, they live in a world. They yes. live in a field, so that's going to happen. They guys, they you want to be American. Yeah, so, so like, in America. What I'm getting at is this kind of perpetual anxiety around being marked with the racial marker, but then in that big show in DC, they got rid of it as a, a, a rhetorical device, rhetorical conceit, which for me betrays precisely what it was of that it's not a settled affair at all, besides what the artist says in the studio. But I think the, the, the whole idea of the black aesthetic has been raging within artistic circles for 50, 60 years. During the 60s, when um, we were actually creating art that we believed had a purpose, the purpose was not only to create something beautiful, but at times something that was wrenching something that would be instructive, something that would create conversation. 
This was in the middle of the civil rights movement. So thus, the art took on a purpose, a higher purpose, other than just being theory and aesthetics. It took on a purpose that incorporated theory and aesthetics and all of the qualities that go into making good art, which is composition, color, and all of those things that, that you know, of the, the parameters of that whole creative process of the visual arts. I want to keep emphasizing that one of the things that happens in contemporary society is that divorce of the visual sciences, which I prefer to call what we do, uh, from the other art forms, which is a reflection of life itself. Dance, when you walk, you're dancing, you're moving. When you talk, you're doing some theater, you're doing some literature. You know, so all of these things, so our view was that the art was an integral part of everyday life. Today, you know, we can sit up and have theory all day. Now, one of the things that I think is important to understand is that critics, get back to Ken Johnson, are paid to critique, all right? One example, and if, uh, I would encourage all of you, if, if you haven't, to get up to the Sacramento, I think, and see Judy Chicago's dinner party. Now, for those of us who maybe a little older than most of you. In the 70s when she created that work, it was such an uproar between uh, what is supposed to be art, and these are mainly white men critics now, between what is art and what is crass. Within the context of uh, the African American experience, just like jazz, but jazz, as you said, I'm not going to say I'm going to create black music, they're creating Jazz music, this is the music that I grew up Well, in Judy Chicago's case, there was such an uproar uh, because there was this question about whether this work, and how many of you in the audience, by the way, have seen the dinner party? Ah, an informal, that's wonderful. <laughs> but in case you didn't know, it was a great uproar in the 70s. Of course, it's bizarre, not because she's glorified in a, in a whole room with the hotel. So all of these things evolve. It's, I'm, I'm feeling very honored and uh, uh, quite amused that I'm sitting up here in 2013, <laughs> still talking about black aesthetics, because that was the same raging issue in the 60s. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, how far have we really come? And will that question ever be resolved? Can I yes, pick up on that? Because um, just last last week at, at the College Art Association, I, would, I went to a panel um, reframing post-black. So it was like, okay, that's like stepping it forward. And I, I knew I was coming here, and I thought, okay, this is like two universes. Some of the issues were exactly the same, which was all, all the artists on the panel were having to, in some way, explain themselves in relation to being black, whether they wanted to or not, whether it was relevant to them or how they do, did it in their work. But at the same time, there was this idea, um, now introduced into it, of post-black. And also the kind of work they were doing was stylistically completely different from anything that we're talking about. It was mostly photo-based, appropriational, you know, more ironic in some cases. Actually, again, very, very diverse stylistically, so that um, each person came at the notion of post-black, and then we're, we're saying, you know, like Corey Newkirk, I think, was saying, like, you know, when, when you're in your studio, you're not necessarily thinking about those those things, so you're thinking about other things, you know, that... that but there's a pocket... Can I... Can I, can I okay. Because I think, that, to your point, but I, I think the, the issue, or how it's different, maybe, um, this conversation, is that I, I think that, you know, um, one, one of the things that we've talked about, Rich, is that it's a, it's it's... It's commodifiable. It's it's a it's it's not so much uh, that when we're talking about uh, or the the, the problem with the, of this idea of a black aesthetic um, is not so much what it might force an artist to do or, or the pressure there is. It's it's how it's how um, th those notions have become commodifiable over time and a marker as to as to as to what to look for when you. You know, when you want to buy a piece of uh, like art. I mean, really intensely commodifiable and right. bringing in an awful lot of money. And so, 
The other question I would have is, is about reframing post black, but before we do that, um, Adrian Piper published something in 1983 in the philosophy journal called News, um, that you might know, in, in which he said that um, art and activism are perpetually at odds because of the kind of institutional agreements made between our institutions, our critics, the curators, and somehow that is a built-in um, interruption to any real conversation around the world and um, what you call the activism. What I'm talking about here, we had the provocation to see Thelma and Glenn's term back in 2001 of post-blackness. We have, we're in this era of a kind of post-racial era, so they say when they election of a black president. But what I'm interested in, and you guys can all speak about this, is this pension in the post-civil rights and certainly post-black era, if we call it that, um, at once intensely commodifying art objects that are made by black folks, but, but, but also disavowing it as black. Which it happens simultaneously to me. Right. So the first part of our conversation here is this whole conversation about post-blackness, folks who have told me and other people that they were told by certain gatekeepers who use Danny's words what to do, what not to do. And the kind of ready, explicit identification of a black aesthetic practice was looked out upon, right? So what do we do and how do we reconcile the kind of rapid commodification of black art and this about of blackness at once? Right. At the same time? But this is an issue that goes back to the very beginning of African Americans who deliberately sought sought to work in a fine arts tradition and enter into the quote unquote the high um, end art world. Yeah. So the barriers to that were first of all access to training, right? And then when you master the technique and you do everything that you're supposed to do, then you you know enter the market and your works are not evaluated based on composition and these uh, visual sciences, they're evaluated based on the fact of your race. And this goes back to Henry Tanner, it goes back to 19th century artists, and it is only this moment of evaluation that is predetermined by race or by gender or by sexuality that um, determines how we see the works and understand the works. But the works themselves and the artists themselves may choose to explicitly respond to these conditions that exist, or they, or they may um, adopt a posture of refusal. But the questions of black art and then post-black art, which was an art that supposedly was freed from the mandate of having to do an identity-based art. Um, still, the, the, the fundamental issues of the art market and the way in which it has been systematically exclusionary to these people, the same way the country is, right? They're, they're, they're fundamentally racially biased. Hence, um, when these people enter, um, if the art entered, like you said, by itself, if uh, you know a William T. Williams entered to the gallery by itself, what an amazing canvas! They learn he's black, and it's a whole different issue. But like the Philly Merkin show, throws that those all into sharp relief for me, right? So you have this discursive, rhetorical, marketed title yes. of a body of really superstar black artists, you know, um, that's called Thirty Americans, mm -hmm. and it's a heavy title. But it's all black artists. So how again do we reconcile that moment of commodification with, in that show, the explicit disavowal of the racial marker? Well, for, look, you know, one of the things I want us to be very clear on, we're talking about a tiny group of people. <laughs> the art market, no, the, the, the people who really are in these conversations and uh, Art itself is a small minority. The art we're talking about now, which is criticized by the New York Times, is a very small minority market. The broader issue is most human beings respond to beauty. So if you look at art in a broader context in this intellectual exchange we're having, which is invaluable because 
it is in these forums that taste, preference, uh, education is spawned for the broader public. But in reality, we as artists, my generation, and I think much of the younger generation uh, outside of academia, are concerned with creating art that affects you, interacts with you. It's not about theory, it's about creating a visual artifact, a visual experience that deals with some emotions. For instance, one of the perfect examples, in my view, is if you go to the music. Now, how many of you would here use the word cool? That's cool, man. That's a, recent, that's a new phenomenon. Cool has been around from the 30s. This is what jazz musician used to mean it's good. So, contemporary society, it's, it's so peculiar. I have left out when I hear my white brethren talking about that's cool. Because at one point, a few years ago, that would be, you know, you're talking now, you're talking slang. Now it's becoming, it becomes fabric, part of the fabric of American dialogue in English. And it's the very same thing with much of the art. I mentioned Whitten, Joe Overstreet and others, who work in the abstract tradition. Now they have, uh, there's no question if you talk that they, they know who they are, they're black people. But they chose, they made a conscious choice to assert their blackness in, I guess in their view, breaking down doors in uh, the art world. Norman Lewis, who was neglected, and I'm very pleased to know that he is now begun getting some of the recognition. He said the whole Jurgens and others who worked in the abstract tradition have been ignored. I think we spoke, to, we spoke about that before, that one of the techniques that the art world uses to control, because remember, it's all about economics. I don't know if any of you saw the Village Voice, not this issue, but an issue before, where they were actually looking at the economics of the art industry and who controls it. And the critics, like in any other field, respond to the marketplace. So again, uh, besides some ignorance that Ken Johnson may have exhibited in his uh, critique of those two particular shows, it's also about the art market. And I, 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 we can't forget it. So Rich, your question about the 30 uh, Americans exhibition and, and the post-black uh, moment is not really about the um, artists themselves per se. Um, some artists may be uh, quite savvy in navigating the market um, and therefore they may um, appear to uh, contribute to this process. But the 30 Americans is really about the curatorial practice. It's about exhibition and display and then also sales. So again, there's a moment when the work leaves the studio and enters into the world that these issues become germane. And for, um, that's the sort of the, the, the paradox as um, that Ken, Ken Johnson says is a paradox that's in the exhibition. But the actual paradox and what is his fundamental flaw with his, his, his um, intellectual project is that his desire for uh, an art that is about art and beauty um, is precisely the, um, the qualities that he denies to artists once their work has been attached to a particular body. And this is something that's consistent through his criticism. I went back and looked at some of his um, other uh, reviews, and this is a consistent trend. He is opposed to identity-based art, but he is the one who is making identity crucial. As if He's, whiteness is not Right. Race. His review of particularly upstairs of the Lucy Lepard exhibition was laudatory because it was about her 
uh, consolidation of the concept of conceptualism. He then puts a dismissive aside at the end about the rest of her project, which was explicitly feminist. So he consistently does this. He, he talks about this in relationship to Chicano artists. He talks about it over and over again. That's, yeah. that's what he would, that's what he, these are the notes that I took the, the night before. And he talked a lot about solidarity, although then he was called on by some people in the audience saying, are you really talking about identity uh, politics? And, um, and he's saying, you know, the problem, this is what he said, and it's, right, it's, it's good to listen to hear it, because then you hear the amount of fear with which he approached the show, which I think is really the paramount issue. Um, my issues with solidarity, there are lots of solidarity movements, different identities, black, gay, feminist. As a critic, you're coming in and you're intimidated. Um, and this is just, talk, I mean, I'm reading it like he's like saying this, but he was just talking like a regular guy. If, this, if the show sucks, but it's about the empowerment of women, how do I modify my criticism? And, well, then it was interesting because one woman, one uh, a person in the audience said, look, if feminism is not strong enough to deal with criticism, and then, you know, it's sort of inaudible, and then she said, you know, we want to engage with real criticism, being soft because you're afraid of offending is counterproductive. Then somebody in the audience said, you know, hey, anyway, you attack plenty of women artists, you know, based on this fear of identity problem. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I, I do want to stress, because I don't think that all art criticism is about criticizing. And I think that the, the, the Times has not answered, it will not answer, but it's not that it hasn't heard. And of course, the, power, the, the real sort of ridiculousness of that whole review was that that show should have been written about by Holland Cotter. Exactly. Who, right, who, and, but uh, my understanding of what I've heard is that for some and Ken Johnson grabbed that review out of, I mean, I don't know, out of Colin's hands, but he, he wanted to write it, which is really weird. But, but it's been interesting to follow, I mean, Colin Cotter has such a history of, of expertise in African art and, and, and being interested in all kinds of, of, of art. But his, his reviews since then, like the review of four exhibition, are like exemplars of what it is that you should do, which is to actually look at the work for whatever it is and talk about the background right. and research it and just like exactly. be responsible, but he does do it. So there are examples. Right. And that's sort of standard of expectation for us from the New York Times that is um, a, a responsibility that Ken Johnson doesn't feel any obligation to meet, which he said at a um, panel in Philadelphia uh, this uh, past weekend at uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. He just wants to um, look at the work, and so in going to the Now Dig This, he's attributing this identity politics on the works, which may or may not have been a frame that the curator wanted to make. She assembled all of these artists. What their individual motives were, um, may or may not have been related to identity politics, right? They were artists working in LA from 1960 to 1980. And yes, there was a lot of racial upheaval and they were responding to it, but they were responding to it with um, aesthetic statements that were intended to be beautiful, compelling, and speak to an audience. Ken Johnson says, the show is black, therefore I'm gonna see identity politics and all of the work. <laughs> Exactly. And as Kelly, Kelly points out, one second more is um, at PS1 last week, she said the show is called Art in Black Los Angeles. So she makes the distinction. I mean, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say the same thing. It's that you know, just I don't know if everybody's seen the show, but you know, there's there's more. There's not just black artists and not just black men who exactly who we were using there. So it's it's a really diverse show. So that says a lot that he goes in and, and frames it as a black show. And maybe Kamara or Will or Edamola, you guys can think about, Mira wrote in, the, in uh, her piece that folks in the McCarthy area famously said didn't um, turn people in to save their lives, they turned folks in to save their swimming pools. So the economy stuff is... That, that was Orson Welles. So. That was Orson Welles. <laughs> was Orson Welles. <laughs> and I think that still happens today when folks are not willing to give up a certain celebrity status. But, but what does resistance look like in the kind of contemporary world? I would say that if you have been 
assigned a subaltern identity in this country in particular, but probably globally, you resist by existing and continuing to aspire and move about the world as if you are entitled to do so. So that was the case for Joshua Johnston, one of the first artists of African descent to work in this country. It was true when Henry Tanner uh, worked at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, although he found he had to leave this country in order to do so and remained uh, abroad for almost 40 years. Um, and it remains true now that exactly the um, economic market forces, these social forces, make uh, our existence one of resistance because according to the system, we should be subject and making our labor available to support the hegemony, right? And if we try to carve out our own lives within that context, we are always resisting. And the nuances may change, um, but, you know, what do they always say? You know, it's same old, same old. So um, the, new, the new twist um, of 30 Americans and the popularity of certain celebrity black artists is a new twist, but it's, you know, it's building on, uh, you know, a very long tradition of uh, negotiation that we participate in as Americans. Thank you. Well, a lot of folks felt, you know, I know, talking to curators and critics of note, anxious about signing the petition. And so it makes me think again, like in this moment, um, you know, and we're not saying gatekeepers to like be resisting fortress walls and making foaming of the mouth comments, but what does resistance, res resistance look like for you? I mean, you enacted some, I think, recently. Yeah, I mean, and to the point, you know, I, I read on uh, uh, the white list, and, and that was, I, it, if I felt it gave me kind of permission that, that maybe this isn't, that I knew, of course, you know, you know the New York Times may hear, as you say, but not, that this isn't going to be something that, you know, it's going to crumble the, <laughs> or whatever, the New York Times or something like that. But but if it's a, it's a small act in, in relationship to a kind of large corporate kind of force. But and so it, and, and I guess it, I, I felt I, and to the to the to the larger point that you're talking about. Um, I can't I can't speak to I can't speak to this larger culture what resistance means in the 21st century. But I guess as an artist. And as an educator, as, a, as an artist, I'm interested in, I am interested in history, and I'm interested in reframing the conversations of history that, that I find curious and interesting, uh, have interest in, that, um, that maybe I even kind of disagree with or butt heads with. And so the work is about kind of trying to find uh, a visual language to reframe those things, a narrative language to reframe those things, and to think about them, and have other people think about them. And as an educator, I think it's important to uh, show, you know, students a wide range of art um, that um, is about a lot of, you know, the same thing. It's, it's, you know, I'm always talking about, you know, Jack Whitten and Joe Overstreet. They're just, they're, they're fine examples, you know, they're just as fine examples as Robert Ryman and, um, and, and Donald Judd and who, whoever those people's contemporaries were. And the more we kind of understand that, you know, break down these categorizations and show the, the kind of continuum of, of these larger, sort of, the art, larger art community, I think the better off we are. Thank you. We have the existential and the um, pedagogical. And of all, you've talked really well this evening about, you know, what the Black Arts Movement was, what it tried to do. What do you think that would look like today? Or how should it Well, uh, listen, I'm alive and well in many Black Arts <laughs> As you know, we haven't been put out the pasture. We're here working, resisting, creating, okay? And, and the very fact that we are still here and look at things like post-blackness as something that is a real oddity, but we understand the commercialization of society, period. So the whole idea of post-black my complexion has not changed. Okay. So those kinds of things you resist out of survival. And you, you try not to, you address them 
so that it doesn't ferment and become the norm, which uh, I hear this idea of post-blackness, which I understand the philosophical framework upon which it was created. I understand what Thelma was trying to do, and she was successful in it, because we're sitting here talking about it. But it also makes us think that there, this, this has been a great change. Listen, there is a tremendous, there's been a quantum leap in terms of consciousness. I see a lot of young people in the audience, and that just thrills me, who are sitting here listening, probably can tell me a lot of stuff that I don't know. And that's healthy. That's moving forward. That's resistance. Because they're going to resist the nonsense, the propaganda, and their free thinking. So free thinking in itself is resistance. Um, so going forward, I think the whole idea of cooperative interaction, what I think, and you can correct me, because I don't have my finger on the pulse of everything, there is this individualism within the art world that has always been there, but then they, they, during the 60s, 70s, maybe 80s, they were real camaraderie, they were real people getting together in the 50s. That's what spawned the abstract, you know, the abstract expressionist movement. These were artists who had issues with society, and those issues brought them together around aesthetic, around aesthetic principles and styles and all of those things. And I don't really see that much happening. Again, brief me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, it's but... It's an word, solidarity. Well, then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but I do think that you're pointing to, or you're, you're, you're naming one direction of, of art, which is away from the individual and towards the collective. I mean, the, the resistance to the market culture is coming from the Occupy movement and from those people who are in the Occupy movement who are involved with art and trying to figure out how to bring those two together and, and um, you know, so there's a lot happening in that, in that place yes. and it challenges certain notions of studio practice and some, you know, ways of being an artist. But that's tied into a social movement again. It is. Which, is very, very yeah. well, which I'm saying, it is. there is a social movement. Maybe this is the, um, no, the great people. And you guys have been incredibly patient. We have a lot to talk about. But um, any questions from the floor, please raise your hand. Elizabeth is right there um, with the microphone. We have to turn the microphone. Fantastic discussion, guys. We're just really scratching the surface. Right? <laughs> uh, OK. Um, maybe this is sort of comically simple, but when you're talking about the, the existence or the non-existence of a black aesthetic, it seems like with artists like uh, Henry Tanner and with uh, Mayor Benyardon, I mean, just by basically depicting African Americans or Africans, they're automatically creating a black aesthetic. You know, so it's sort of the the movement already exists, right? I mean, no, no, because you're 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 conflating two things, which is subject matter versus. Object matter. So you've got the sub. The, you've got the subject matter, which let's say is an African American subject, an image. But that the, if the style is still, um, you know, influenced by the French Academy, then style is something different. But I mean, the style doesn't have to be centered around. I mean, you can start up center a style around anything, an aesthetic style around anything that is, that's aesthetic. So I mean, the black figure itself is an aesthetic object. That's, that's an aesthetic truth. You can center an entire style around that. Well, there's or a, even around the color. There's another, I think there's another issue at the heart of what you're talking about, which because you, know, you have to bring up, say, like Tanner, somebody who represents fig figures you know, and, and, and actual people. And the, the point of that work is, a, is, is the same, uh, I would assume it's the same point of, uh, say, if you painted, uh, if you're a white person painting an image, of, you know, like a, a white image, is that you're you're getting at some uh, some sense of humanity, and I think that the, I think the struggle in all this and the, the sort of the, the, the you know this this kind of uh, racial uh, neuroses that we live in in this culture is that you you, you know as a black artist you actually have to fight to say that this black body actually represents 
a, a, a universal humanity in which uh, you can, if anybody can identify with. So no, it's not about a, it's not about a black aesthetic. You know, it's not, that's not the point. The point is the same point that if you were a white man painting a, painting an image of a white person and you were concerned with the, that, uh, that the picture's humanity, that would be that's the same concern. It's not it's not a stylistic concern. If you're black, you're expected to make black subject matter, recognizably black subject matter, which means you had to put black bodies on your canvas, on your pedestal. But many, many, many other people made work with black bodies and fetishized the black body moreover. So I mean, the, I mean, there's the, two separate yeah, it's issues like, is, again. Is, is Thomas Hart Bitten, you know, is, is he making a black aesthetic? I guess yeah. I want to like interrupt. You want to finish your question, sorry? You want to? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I don't mean to, like, I'm not, I don't mean to put up too much of a fight here. I, I'm just saying that, you know, when Michelangelo makes the day, he's not objectifying the whiteness. So I don't see why Romero Biedon depicting, or any artist, is necessarily objectifying blackness by depicting Africans or African Americans, people with black skin. I don't think it's a, you know, I don't think it's, Let's phrase the question just a little bit differently to say that somehow what we're, what, what, what Carrie James Marshall is getting at, and Carrie's a pretty smart guy, you know, what he was suggesting is not about styles, of course, because Adamola talked about why we vary. In all of our complexity, we can straddle painting, sculpture, all of that stuff. So it's not something about aesthetics and style as being somehow in like perpetual opposition. What he was asking, and again, an open ended question, is that desirability of a tradition loosely formed, right? It's not some injunction or mandate for you to conform to this or that. He's talking about the same way as the guy saying back there, that we, there are art students, some of them citizen, uh, who just graduated sitting right here, um, who can point to what does collage look like for beard, for instance? And, is that, and what does it look like when you're doing it with a black body? AJ, Arthur J. Fred did stuff with film that completely transformed the genre itself. A recent article talked about this, how the black figure or subject looks on the screen, on cellulite. So an open-ended question is being met by resistance at some level, but I'm just, when it's really open-ended, it's asking the question about what can we gather from the fragmented history of Black's experience in the final world. Right. The representation of the Black body and the uh, Black bodies of artists are, I think, two separate things, which is, we saw you sort of maybe conflating the two, and we wanted to make a certain <coughs> distinction between that. When Michelangelo makes David, he's representing the human figure to embody a certain set of ideas. Why? What? They may or may not be, I mean, people might say they were, it was a celebration of, of Flor, Florentine identity, right? <laughs> black bodies and white bodies historically have had different meanings attached to them. So when people choose to represent black bodies, they're coming up against the idea of what that black body means. And people who are of African descent often try to reframe that definition that the culture has of what the black body means. But white artists do too. William Christopher, who was the life partner of the artist George Tooker, was deeply invested and inspired by the 1963 March on Washington and Martin Luther King, and did a whole series of images celebrating the life of Martin Luther King. This is a white elite artist who had no obligation to do so, but he attempted to also redefine what the black body meant. So it can, um, what the subject matter connotes is, um, I think, distinct from the person who speaks. This is, I, one of the things that is very interesting is, let's just take Romeo Beard. He glorified the idea of the black body. His work also is integrated with Mondrian. If you look at some of the way he creates his paintings, the idea of collage could go back to Picasso, Riss, many of them. And then you take another example of, say, a William T. Williams, and you look at Zulu houses, the way they were painted in South Africa. <coughs> or you look at Stella, the way his earlier works, use line and form which could really be linked 
to those Zulu houses of South Africa. It also engages contemporary modern thinking, modern design out of Europe. So I, to be quite frank with you, this whole discussion <laughs> is an exercise in futility <laughs> in trying to arrive at any concrete uh, definition of black art. I think some of the issues we did cover, such as resistance, is very, very important and critical. But I don't believe, just as you're not going to be able to define music, yes, there's a certain style and rhythm, uh, you know, the way you execute that is peculiar to the black experience and the black rhythm. But it's music. And uh, in Europe, there's a great movement. As a matter of fact, I just sent some images to the Jazz Institute in Germany. Uh, a lot of the Europeans over there who have been playing jazz for the last 50 years, they have claimed it. You'll have a hard time explaining to some of them that this began with Miles Davis or, 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 or Louis Armstrong because they have claimed it. They might have to explain to okay. <laughs> um, other questions in the back? I'm glad you brought it to music because as a musician, a lot of the conversation is confusing because when I think of... of Which conversation is confusing? Ours? The, the whole conversation about art, you kept trying, I heard you particularly kept trying to go, we've got to include all the arts in this conversation. And that's something I, I was trying to figure out too because as a musician, for me, I think of it this way. As a black musician, my job is syncretism. I'm supposed to bring things together. So if I hear something from Europe that I like, I'm supposed to include that in my music. If I hear something from South Africa I like, I'm supposed to include that in my music. So that when you come to my music and look to define it... What if you heard something by Bach that you like? Ex exactly. I would, I would include it in my music. I think Thelonious Monk did that. All of our great masters did that. And so when we come to this question of finding one particular way of looking at it, I agree with you when you say it becomes futile. Because to me, the main thing that makes the art black, when I look at hip-hop, when I look at jazz, when I look at these forms, is the idea that it's a, its ability to take everything in, which comes from that philosophy from South Africa that says Ubuntu, we exist because, because of each other, which exists diametrically opposed to the European idea of I think, therefore I am. So we're supposed to be syncretic in our art, and that's what makes it black to me. Other comments, questions? I would say that, we, like you said, visual artists do take from everywhere. We don't always want to acknowledge or recognize it, but they absorb the same way as musicians do things from a variety of sources and then use it to as the basis of their their artwork. But that's not limited to black artists. That's basically yeah, any artist. <laughs> <I'm not sure laughs> Other questions? Uh, that was wonderful, guys. Every, everything was really good. I wonder if um, Carrie James Marshall um, called to this, again, new black aesthetic tradition um, could be an attempt to um, force critics like you know, Johnson, Ken Johnson, to put work in a certain context that is better informed or more informed about what artists <coughs> live through and bring to their work. Um, you know, personally, I don't think it's necessary. I think they should do their homework before creating, you know, reviews. But I wonder if Carrie is thinking in that way, like, let me set the standard or show or talk or set up what it is artists' concerns are so that when it's looked at or understood, it can be understood in an informed way. This is an incredible question because I'm a scholar of American studies um, and includes the Americans. And like Kamara said before, if you know about you know, Shakespeare versus the traditional African American literature, for instance, because folks have gone before and folks have studied it, right? So there's no impulse here from Carrie James Marshall for sure to contain or delimit or to verify one category or another. What he's curious about, I think, is what um, 
Deirdre is suggesting that somehow, despite the viral the synchronicity that informs all the work that we do, we're all each other's, you know, we're related people. Um, that there's something definitive that we may, might say we can relate this to that. It's not trying to give you a mantle or wear this garment called black. It's, it's something about the work that pedagogically, ideologically, like epistemologically, is important and illuminating. There's all these suggestions that we have to build it again. So like Deirdre suggests that someone like Ken Johnson doesn't have to kind of parachute in and make something up. But he um, explicitly stated um, last weekend um, that he did not do research prior to going to the show, and he feels no obligation, in fact, does not want to do the research before going to the show. So he was perhaps uninformed about the artists themselves, besides uh, David Hammond, who he seems to like. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was uninformed about the curatorial practices. That's where I see his flaw, as I said. Someone like Colin Cotter is deeply well-informed, and when he goes to an exhibition, which I think is the role of the critic, he examines the art and he examines the exhibitionary framework and evaluates and assesses them for both their strengths and their weaknesses. Ken Johnson does not feel that that's his job. Um, I personally would say that someone like that should not have um, a job at the Times because he has a, a public platform um, basically to just uh, articulate his own biases rather than helping to inform his readership. Um, I guess I'm kind of interested in the commodification of resistance um, as one thing, but also, you know, being um, a resident of the Studio Museum, interested in uh, the idea of the the, now that this show as a corrective measure, as you've described it, the Studio Museum also acting as a corrective measure, um, and sort of interested in when those sort of institutions will expire, or how um, the sort of the, the box is, I feel like you described a, a, a kind of a box that I just got put into, almost as uh, victimizing, but feeling like that's still being perpetuated, and maybe, um, I don't know, that's, Something that interested. This is precisely why the Studio Museum was founded. I mean, these questions that you're asking are precisely, um, you know, this conundrum that we face. You know, how do we uh, respond to the situation of, of what the art world is? Um, we can, you know, propose a, a dialogue on the black aesthetic to force people to understand um, ways of making art and design and viewing the world that they may not be uh, ordinarily privy to, even though we, I think we agree that they should be. Um, and uh, how do you um, break open the box, create a space for everyone to participate? Um, and so the black aesthetic, multiculturalism, these various movements and ideas have always attempted to um, put that forward. But again, they're always caught up in the you know, betwixt and between um, the issues at the Museo del Barrio right now with the directors um, brings up this uh, idea as well. Um, over its history, the Studio Museum, which was a similarly motivated institution, um, has continued to thrive and adapt and shifted the dialogue, maybe to post-blackness, or maybe not, but um, you know, have to evolve with these situations. And of course, if we become really Marxist, right, it's all, it is uh, all about the, the market and you have to adapt to it. And all of these institutions and debates help us with that. Um, and hopefully, yes, there will be a moment when we would move to a different stage, but. I want to uh, just, when she died, what I was saying, when she died, I'll come back to she died, because I didn't respond. What I was trying to say is not so much his work stylistically, but the support that he got from the Italian art world began to support his work. Came as a result, not only just brilliance as an artist, as a Billy good dad, but the fact that he had a body of support behind him. You are our body of support going forward. If this uh, hierarchy is to be Neutralized. 
key makers have all the big money. It's going to be in your hands, and that's what I'm saying. When there is a popular support of what art is, and it's taken out of you know, this elitism, then we will begin to see some real changes, not only in giving us some relief so that we can work without having to be uh, enslaved by the tenets of the art market and the whims and wishes of a few people in this village. Well, did you see that village of voice? You should get that. It's really, it's I read that. Uh, you know, yeah. Right. I mean, um, so that, that's all I'm saying, is that the future going forward is going to be in your hands. Before we close, I wondered if um, we have time for one more question or no? One, well, you guys put your questions together quickly. Uh, uh, Sean and this lady right here. Let's take both questions. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah, the same time. Um, I guess sort of as a follow up to Jennifer's question slash that general conversation specifically about like uh, resistance and categories, maybe like how we're going to deal with that. It seems like, especially uh, this conversation has made it really clear that there's like a lot of confusion around like. Um, when like the category or like the nominative distinction becomes like a strategical force and like when that's gonna be a rhetorical uh, like political power move and like when that's impressive, right? Or when that's like not something that you wanna take about because we like quote don't think about it in the studio as artists or because like we're more complicated or complex as individuals, right? Um, and when we're gonna take a more sort of like uh, I'm an individual free thinker, like my resistance is like charting my course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, That's and, a great question. And how it, 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 it seems as though, like, especially talking about what solidarity means in terms of an affiliation with a kind of group, right, and also, like, uh, in the world that we're going to inherit or live in, like, what it's going to look like to have categories or not categories, and, like, why it's so, like, either okay or if it just happens to use categories as strategical movement points? Or Thank you so much. much. And then, Sean, before you answer, well, yeah, it falls very much in line with that question that there was an interesting response to both the petition and Holland Collar's review that uh, that the argument really, sh there, was, there was a similar response that the art with an argument that until an exhibition like Ford does not exist, and regardless of the individual artist's concerns, whether it's identity politics or not, yes. until we divorce the work from an exhibition in the language of that exhibition, you know, certain language, will we not achieve that next step that you believe? This is a brilliant closing question about categorization. Yeah. So the idea for itself is being a marked enterprise. Right? I have a, a response that I no, think goes back to Morrison. Let's we'll start with Will and okay. then here. And then yeah, um, category. I, th I think part of the confusion kind of stems because, if, at least from that article, um, or to try to clarify what's happening here, the confusion in that article is that uh, Ken took a very uh, a extremely organized uh, curatorial project that is not confused at all and confused it with this debate about the art market and, and, and black artists' uh, sort of uh, viability. Uh, you know, relative, you know, relative to our market, which is not what the show was about at all. So you have kind of a, a big mess in which people then are trying to kind of, uh, you know, s s parse these things out and correct the context in which the show resides in, in, in which, you know, uh, questions about the art market inclusion, exclusion uh, reside. And so, these, these are all different spheres in which uh, you know uh, have been kind of confused, and, that, and that's that's a big problem in in a, in a society which has not sort of completely healed from an idea of any racism. It still sort of is, uh, is is still kind of a problem. Um, it, it, the confusion does not help. <laughs> so so these conversations need to be had, uh, at least especially for people who want to who want to try to understand them. Or am I even find them a little confusing when I, you know? I think that the, the exhibition, I think everything is good in a sense that, that it's, it, those exhibitions will continue as long as they're needed. They'll shift in a way. I, I haven't seen the four exhibitions, but I heard um, Naima Keith 
um, talk about it. And in a way, I thought, wow, she's so lucky. She gets to curate a show which sounds lively, filled with different kinds of art. Actually, she's way luckier than, than curators at more, uh, you know, the established white institutions that are actually very restricted in some way in what they can show artistically. And um, so I, 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 don't, I feel like it's fine. It's fine and things end when they end, you know. So the point at which there's no need for it really, then it probably will shift to something else. There are moments where things overlap. So there, you know, there's some uh, women-only art galleries that, you know, co co cooperatives like AI Art Gallery that are sort of in that moment where is, is there a need for this or not? Does a younger generation need it or not? And there's shifts in the art world where all of a sudden something, in any world, where suddenly something happens and something new comes along. And then so then there'll be a new version of the same discussion, probably, because there because those things about who is in, who's out, who has power is 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 the human story of human Keeps history, going. unfortunately. So brief last of yeah. the Kamar and yeah. the Yeah, as we um, study race as opposed to uh, defining blackness, uh, what becomes evident is that uh, this question that you have about categories and when they're no longer necessary or the freedom to think beyond them has been a privilege of whiteness. As whiteness fashions itself as the universal, although it's deeply embodied, they, they um, take on the ability to just be and to think freely and to do whatever and never to mark themselves as whatever. Um, so that very thing in a, in a way has been commodified. And so uh, this particular type of response to categorize or, or actually respond to the categorization project that came about as a part of the modern um, society is uh, a way to attempt to sort of dismantle it or break it apart. But I believe um, that, as Mira was saying, the sh these, that effort to define or to categorize and to challenge that, uh, the, the categories will be um, there as long as they're needed to be, um, till the ability to just be is a, 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 a something that is afforded to everyone. Or you wake up one day and suddenly it's possible that what had been the power structure no longer has power. And, and it, you, it seeps up on you just the way climate change seeps up on you. There's that, all of a sudden there's a point where... With less some, than the terrorist effects. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And about the last one from you, remember? Yeah, well, I've, I've uh, firstly, I'm very pleased to be sitting amongst such distinguished thinkers and uh, such a responsive audience. Uh, I have lived long enough uh, to have seen a quantum leap in terms of consciousness. Uh, people's receptibility to the diversity within the African American community, uh, people's acceptance of one another. Uh, I think this is spawned by um, integration, but integration among those people, but there's also integration. Many young people today are from mixed parentage. That is very important. Uh, Barack Obama is a perfect example of that. So it begins to change the discourse of what is black and what is not black. At one point, uh, if you had one drop of black blood in you, you were considered black. Well, still, well, Barack yeah, Obama is a biracial president. What Mara is saying is there's an evolution now where that is beginning to be a little more blurred. And as we go forward into the future, I think we'll see more and more what we call become the cross polarization of the actual human body, but also our thinking and the way we look at art as a, a, a vehicle for not just expression, but as uh, portals I think the for, nice for new vistas. And we can't even think about it right now because they still to be invented. But the fact that we have open that dialogue, open those portals, by both well for the future. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our amazing panel.